Hi everyone, welcome to the faculty presentation series that we're having at Compass. Um, so today we have Dr. Lisa Beal. Uh, she is a seagoing researcher and professor here at UM. And so her current projects is what she'll be covering today. Uh, these are using a combination of in-situ observations, satellites, and models. And this is to aim to help our understanding of the Western Boundary Currents and their role in climate change. So thank you everyone for coming today and welcome Lisa. Wow, round of applause before I've even started. Um, actually, I do deserve a round of applause because I was up till 2 a.m. last night. <laughs> um, so yeah, so Roland asked me to do something that just introduced everything the Beal Lab is about. So this is going to be very much an overview of a lot of things that we've done in the past and that we're up to now. You know, so if you have some deep and dirty questions, you know, um, we can talk about it afterwards. Um, you may well do, because I don't have time for any details. Uh, so we'll start with who am I? Um, so I was largely aiming this at students because, you know, some of you, <laughs> we've been colleagues for 20 years plus, you know well who I am. Um, well, this would be one way of saying who I am, right? Lisa Beale, the scientist. Uh, so I started by doing uh, oceanography in Southampton in the UK, where I did my PhD. I had postdocs um, on both the East Coast and the West Coast of the US. And then I came to Rosenstiel in 2003. My first seagoing experiment as chief scientist was that same year, so it was a, it was a big year for me. And um, in 2006, I kind of started my efforts championing women in oceanography, and there's various things you can see um, over the years, efforts that I've done related to that. One rather fun one is that the Smithsonian Museum still has my Women in Oceanography uh, film on their website. Uh, I also run a scientific workshop, which is also something uh, professional development for graduate students, which I believe in a lot. And I've been running that since 2010 with my friend uh, and professional author, Dallas Murphy. Um, it's a great workshop when you uh, have your first paper ready, uh, come to the workshop and uh, we can help you uh, get it ready for submission. Uh, I became a professor in 2014. And uh, then I became Associate Dean of Research 2016 to 2019. This was definitely elevated to my level of, uh, of uh, <laughs> I was going to say discomfort, but it could be uh, <laughs> incompetence is the usual term, right? This was my level of incompetence, definitely. Um, and since then, I've been doing uh, some more community work. So, uh, for example, the Global Ocean Observing System, or GOOSE. Um, I was the Indian Ocean Panel Chair for Goose and uh, lead author of um, a review that we did for the entire Indian Ocean Observing System um, uh, 10 years after it was uh, created. And then more recently, my community work is as editor-in-chief at JGR Oceans, which is also a lot of fun. So who am I as a human? <laughs> you know, not just a scientist. Um, so when I was growing up, I was kind of, you probably described me as awkward, very curious about a lot of things, um, sometimes quite vexed, um, from North London. Uh, in the UK, I found my passion for physics, for sure. Um, I also found passion for justice, I believe in justice, and the joy of hiking in the wilderness. Um, and they keep me going to this day. Uh, when I moved to New York, Rollerblading in Central Park, that was, that, was, that was the thing. I was so happy to do that. I also found clubbing in the meatpacking district. Um, and I became a MoMA member, so I learned a lot about modern art. Uh, in California, I met my queer family. Um, I failed tragically at surfing, but I excelled at tango dancing. And I still tango dance now, but not as often as I would like. Um, in Miami, uh, I began my, my kind of team swimming hobby um, for an LGBTQ team called the Nadadores. And, uh, you know, I, I'm now, <laughs> I've now been a team member there for 20 years. So um, uh, I did suffer some personal loss early in my, early in my time in Miami. 
Um, and then happier times, I've been a doggy mum, she passed um, a partner, and now a granny, which has been very fun. Okay, so what are the overarching questions that drive the Beale Lab? There's really two. How are Western Boundary Current systems changing with climate change? And how will they feed back then on climate change? These are really the questions that you know keep me vexed and curious. So why, what's the big deal about Western Boundary Currents? Why should we understand them better? Well, you may not know this, this is the um, TAD2 SST reanalysis of uh, sea surface temperature um, over the last century and a half. And if you take away the global trend, then you see that the Western Boundary Current systems really light up. This is the Brazil Malvinas, this is the Agulhas, this is the East Australia current, this is the Corocio, and our friend the Gulf Stream. It's right on our doorstep here. So these systems really light up as parts of the ocean that are warming two or three times faster than the global average. Why is that? So tropical western boundary currents, they're fast, they're narrow, they carry a lot of heat, nutrients, uh, uh, deficit in, in anthropogenic carbon. They carry a lot of fluxes, a lot of properties, meridionally in the climate system. That's, that's an important thing in the climate system, to be able to get heat from the tropics towards the poles, from where, it's, where there's a lot of heat coming in from the sun uh, to where there's much less heat. That means it plays a role in moderating uh, our global climate. And they also give up a lot of heat to the atmosphere. So this is a picture of air sea fluxes. Uh, negative air sea fluxes is from the ocean to the atmosphere. And you can see again that all these regions, the Agulhas current here, East Australia, Corocio, Gulf Stream, and Brazil Malvinas, they all light up as parts of the globe that fuel <coughs> the atmosphere with heat, um, fueling the storm tracks uh, and rainfall. And if you're not yet convinced that Western Boundary Currents um, are rather fun and exciting, um, there's local effects too of these currents. So this shows an example in the Agulhas Current off the east coast of South Africa. Um, and it shows, this is sea surface temperature, and you can see an enormous meander um, going, propagating past this, this, uh, this region where we were taking, uh, where we were taking uh, well, we were on a ship at the time, taking samples and uh, measurements. And when you get one of these meanders uh, separating the, uh, the current from the coast, it causes a lot of upwelling. So you see this is a vertical section down to 500 meters through the water column at potential temperature. In each case, this is before or at the, at the crest of the meander, and this is during the meander. And you can see how these density levels are pulled right up and this cold water is coming right up over the shelf here um, compared to this picture here where these cold waters are down below 200 meters. And these kind of events, um, you know, all kinds of mesoscale activities and sub-mesoscale activities, uh, a lot of instabilities associated with western boundary currents because they're so energetic. And so they actually cause um, extreme, rather extreme environments on the shelves next to western boundary currents. They can wash, wash the shelf with warm waters and they can flush the shelf with cold waters. Um, and the, this supports uh, productivity um, and a lot of biodiversity on the, in these regions. Okay, so why is observing them important? Because you know, from my perspective, I go out to sea and I collect data um, that's not the easiest way to study Western boundary currents, right? These days you could get a model um, and, and do it without feeling seasick um, and leaving your doggy at home. Uh, but, you know, models um, rely on observations and our understanding of the real ocean in order to parameterize processes that they cannot capture. And Western boundary currents are one of those processes, you know, we have seen a leap forward 
in model resolution um, of late, you know, ocean models now contain sub mesoscales, for example. Um, some climate models are eddy permitting or even um, uh, eddy resolving. Uh, I work with uh, Ben on his eddy resolving climate model. But most climate models still would show you the agolus like this. So the agolus is a system that actually retroflects and feeds back into the Indian Ocean largely, right? And in this climate model, it does no such thing. It basically just kind of peters out westward into the Atlantic. So that gives you enormous biases um, in terms of the, uh, the heat and salt in the Atlantic, for example. So I think it's important to go out there and observe them. So how do we observe Western boundary current systems at the Beale Lab? Well, um, there's a lot of acronyms here, but you know, in my career I started out as somebody who specialized in something called Lowered Acoustic Doppler Current Profiler. So a, a current meter basically that works with acoustics um, and you can put it on a CTD package and lower it through the water column. That was kind of a new technique uh, 25 plus years ago. That's where I started um, and with CTDs and I moved into moorings and then I moved into sea pies, um, these current and pressure uh, sensor equipped inverted echo sounders that sit at the bottom of the ocean and just ping and can measure through round trip travel time heat content um, and, and uh, current structure, the depth of the thermocline and so on. Uh, through the drifters, and now we've even got a few biogeochemical sensors in the, in the Beale Lab. And plus, many collaborations uh, uh, with people who have even more toys. So probably the simplest way to show you um, what we do in the Beale Lab is to um, have a look at our latest voyage. To the Cape Basin. together, mm. quantify in as many different kind of dynamical regimes as possible mm -hmm. what the mixing looks like mm -hmm. in the ocean between the Indian Ocean waters and the mm -hmm. Atlantic. Mm -hmm. We can use kind of this eddy flux framework to kind of use that, those measures of diffusivity to estimate just how much water mm -hmm. is kind of leaking from the Atlantic. So here we're looking at, you know, with the package that went over the side, this is real-time feed data from the instrument. And you can see we're down at about 3,200 feet. The depth is given there. It's a lot of energy that the ocean is moving for us away from the tropics towards the poles uh, for free, you know, each and every day. How does the agolus come into that? So the agolus is feeding up back into the Gulf Stream, and the effect of those waters leaking from the Agolas uh, on the sinking of waters in the North and North Atlantic is, we think, substantial. So we can run models that show that this leakage, if it changes, can change the strength of the heat transport in the Atlantic. So it can change the amount of heat that's going up into the North Atlantic and Arctic oceans. And that's huge because it's gonna affect ice, it's gonna affect temperatures across North America and Europe, um, and in fact, it affects climate globally um, with all kinds of teleconnections <coughs> both the ocean and the, and the atmosphere. And this cruise is um, something is basically kind of between the cracks. Maybe we should have, <laughs> we should have called it between the cracks instead of quiche, but um, you know, we're basically kind of focusing on what's in and between the eddies rather than what's in the eddies. <coughs> As you can see that while we have an eddy here, an eddy here, an eddy here, you can see that the ocean is pulled around into kind of rivers and streams and filaments and these 
eddies are basically kind of uh, drawing out this Indian Ocean water around them and between them into these filaments that get thinner and thinner and thinner. And then uh, eventually they get so thin that diffusion dissipates them altogether and the system becomes well mixed. We are waiting for the bridge to say, okay, go. When the bridge says, okay, go, we will get our instrument picked up, lowered over the side, and we'll start doing profiling for turbulence. So that gives us a measurement that allows us to be able to quantify how much mixing is going on within the water. You know, the kind of vertical mixing between water masses. So they let the probe like free fall down to about a thousand meters in the water column. And then they pull it back up and they do the whole thing again. So they'll be doing that for 20 hours continuously because in the ocean we have these things called inertial cycles and they're driven by the rotation of the earth. Um, and they mean that kind of mixing kind of happens in bursts at particular times in this inertial cycle. It was the first uh, launch of drifters for this cruise. We launched like 48 uh, in within like what, four hours or something? The idea was to create a, a drifting instrument that would uh, track the current. There's actually not a regular buoy, but uh, more like a donut shape, so that you spread the buoyancy very low to the water, so you reduce the influence of the wind. The idea of this drifter is that it's so small and low cost that you can deploy large numbers, and you get a sort of a, a, a nice coverage of an area. Part of our exercise is to measure how fast things that are starting together how fast do they go apart, and that gives us a measure of the mixing rate uh, in the area. This guy is designed to profile, so we can drive the ship along, and we can make it profile, and it gets very high resolution cycles through the ocean, and with those cycles you get like a really nice sort of plot, so to speak, uh, you know, a very high resolution version of everything that's happening at depth sort of a lot easier than they could do with that. Um, so really it's about the sort of resolution of the cycles and how deep you can do them. We'll be on station at 0800, take off one engine. At that time right now you're on one and three, we're at 640, base course 333, just kind of coming in. Um, they're going to put out the wire flyer, so head into the sea and swell for the deployment and then turn around and looks like another trough course. One of the, the most expensive things on the ship is fuel. So whenever we don't need the two engines, so the two engines that gives us 12 knots through the water. So when we're steaming between stations, we try to go as fast as possible, economically, you know, sustainable. And then when we get on the station, we go down to one, which cuts our fuel consumption in half. Every day we meet up as a PI group so that we can look at what the ocean conditions are on this day. So we use a lot of satellite data, including sea surface temperature sea surface height, which tells us something about the way the ocean is moving. We can also use some of the information that we now have put in the water. So for instance, Guy is tracking the 48 drifters we already deployed. And uh, we can look at um, some of the wire flyer information and so on. So we try to look at this information and figure out what's going on in the ocean and where we want to measure next. The blue colors are basically the Benguela upwelling. So we've got upwelling of cold waters from below. And then we've got these warm Indian Ocean waters coming in and mixing with some Atlantic waters. And, you know, so we, we can see that there's a front here. All right, so we definitely don't want to change where we're going, right? That's still pretty good, I think it's good. place. And remember, we're up here for the weather. In a way, I think we should look at the weather quickly and then do it before we think of timing. Yeah, so one of the reasons we came north, right, uh, is, is because of this guy here, this system here. Well, we don't want anything to do with that because we can't continue our work, so 
So we decided to come further north in this the kind of word dynamic positioning system is what we use here, DPOS-1. It's driving all the thrusters right now, both stern thrusters and our bow thruster. Um, I put in the heading and then I have the joystick. So right now the joystick is pushed over to the left, so it's kind of making the ship go to the left and then I have it pushed a little bit ahead too, so it's kind of crabbing to the left and forward. Um, that's one of the ways that you can use the system. But you can also just say, hold me right here on this position. And then you can move the little cursor on the screen and it will drive around the map wherever you move it on the screen, which is pretty cool. Having women in oceanography is so important because um, for so many years it's been a male dominated field. When I started, I mean, it wasn't uncommon to be the only woman on a ship. And yeah, I'd say to be quite honest, it's pretty traumatizing. It's pretty unpleasant. I mean, you get a lot of focus on you and your abilities. You know, people are constantly asking you to prove yourself over, you know, the men. So it's really tiring and you feel really isolated. But I've also had some great experiences and particularly once I got into a position of being able to, you know, bring in more women into science, it's just brought me more and more joy. Women are, are so great to work with, they're so insightful, they're so collaborative, and it just is a totally different feeling out here. So It's a current and pressure recorded inverted echo sounder. So it measures bottom current. That's uh, measured 50 meters above the seafloor. So the instrument will sink and stay at the seafloor. And then I'll have a 50 meter cable. That's this black cable that you see. And I'll have a current meter. Inside the instrument, it measures the pressure. So it's measuring bottom pressure. And so with the sea pies next to the tall mooring, we'll be able to measure very accurately sea surface height and those two components. You know, like how tight are the molecules together? Is it really tight together and is the sea surface height small or are they really far apart and moving around and hot and there's a lot of sea surface height? And then we'll be able to measure mass. So that's what we're doing. deploy a glider, uh, in this case it's a six floor glider, there are different brands. Mm -hmm. uh, this one is equipped with very, very special sensors. We have a microstructure sensor that's going to give us turbulence, which is very, very small motions and instabilities in the ocean that generate mixing of different properties. Uh, we also have the other sensors, such as the CPD, so we're going to measure salinity, temperature, and oxygen uh, of, in the ocean. And another very special sensor we have in this glider is an ADCP, which is going to measure currents, the speed of the of the ocean, of the different layers of the ocean. Even more as I get older, that becomes one of the essential ingredients for me about doing the science, is having along the best people. Um, and when I say best, I mean not only the excellence in terms of the science, but also the excellence in terms of uh, wanting to teach and wanting to open the science and the understanding of the ocean up for everybody and wanting to see that there's a role for everybody in that. I think it was amazing the way a lot of people pulled together and just made it work. You know, the, the ship and the wire flare guys were like, okay, we're going to figure out how to deploy something off the side of the ship and you know instead of thinking about what we can't do they were all thinking about what we could do two people can be kind of walking around once it gets here once the wire gets tight and it's sort of under control mm -hmm. then we'll drag the car out of the way i also think it's an incredible team you know we're we're like from four institutions or 
So and Miami, so for your, plus the uh, South African institutions. Plus, yeah, so Cape Town, uh, Gothenburg, Rhode Island, <laughs> Miami, <laughs> and Wales. Yeah, so we're five institutions. And yeah, I think the students were saying before that they've made lifelong friends. It's going to take us a long time to understand this data, right? Because we've collected a lot of data. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we did. And a lot of different, like using a lot of instruments that even you and I, after 25 years, have never used before. Mm -hmm. And ways in which we've not seen the ocean before, which is exciting. Mm -hmm. uh, aiming for recovering of uh, one of the uh, gliders, the Sea Explorer. And it's uh, right over there. That was the sun. In a way, this is like the end of the beginning. Mm -hmm. And then we've got kind of the rest of many years to come of kind of figuring out what this data is about. I think one thing is that what happens, right, is that we all go home and we and we process our data, right? So when you start processing your data, you fall in love with it, right. and it tells you a story. Uh, we're about to launch a uh, wave glider. And this one's adapted to measuring uh, CO2, how much CO2 is going between the atmosphere and the ocean, or the ocean and the atmosphere. And uh, we're going to deploy this uh, wave glider, and we hope to recover it way after the voyage, maybe in uh, two, three months, if everything goes well, maybe four months. And the wave glider is going to sail all the way back to Cape Town on its own, and then we're going to recover it there with a small boat. Okay. The biggest instruments we have are these acoustic Doppler current profilers which have these la four large transducer heads and they profile through the water column measuring Doppler shift which actually gives you velocity. So these guys are very clever, they have no moving parts, they basically just use the acoustics and they can also profile the water column so we get a measure of the current not just where the instrument is but for f about 500 meters above the instrument. It'll profile through the water column and give us a velocity every 20 meters or so. And I feel like this beginning part is all that super steep climb that you take, you know, on the on the roller coaster, uh -huh. like before you go down. And sometimes it stops in the middle and you're like, oh no. <laughs> Am I going backwards or forwards? But then it keeps going. But that's like a really hard time, right? That's the hard part, right? right. And I feel like now we're kind of right at the tip. And there's going to be like a lot of fun stuff happening. There's still going to be some of those mini ups and downs, but yeah. it's mostly going to just be like, I think, a really fun ride. <clears throat> the end that was Young's, uh, Young's quiche logo there. Lots of, uh, lots of silliness with the quiche logo. Um, okay, so that's, <laughs> that's, now you get the feeling of what the Beale Lab does at sea. Um, quiche was definitely the largest project I've ever led. Um, I think there were 30 of us, 30 scientists aboard on the Roger and Bell. It was a great cruise. Uh, so now I want to take some time to just mention some past research highlights. Um, it's really kind of hard to choose what, um, but uh, anyway, I gave it a go. So I think I have two or three in here. So one headline, the Agolas current is broadening and not strengthening. Uh, this is um, some work that I did, it was called the Agolas current time series. 
Uh, it started around 2009 and ran through to 2015, 2016. And we put uh, moorings in the Agulhas current for about three years. And, uh, and then we, from those moorings, we got a time series of the transport of the current. Um, and from that time series, this mooring uh, ray was designed to go on an altimeter ground track. And so we were able to take those three years of measurements and uh, extend them to 25 years using the altimeter measurements. Um, and what we discovered is that our expectation was the Agulhas current is strengthening. That was what the ocean models, the hindcasts were showing um, at that time. And what we found instead was that the current's actually broadening. So if you look at these two, and there's a gray and a red, that's because we, um, we kind of developed two measures of the integrated transport of the Agulhas current, because it's difficult, you know, kind of where does the current end, you know, is a, quite a tricky question. So we, uh, so we did that in a couple of different ways, that's all that is, but you can see that no matter which way we calculated it, um, between the, um, the solid lines at the beginning of the time series, and the dashed lines at the end of the time series that this kind of uh, illustrates the trend that we found, um, you can see that the current transport has reduced somewhat and the current has broadened so there's more transport offshore. And what's interesting is that you can look at the kinetic energy trend and that shows you that at the same time the eddy kinetic energy uh, is increasing all the way across the boundary layer. And so what's going on is um, that the current itself has more eddy kinetic energy, it's more unstable, and so it's becoming uh, broader, so the boundary layer, if you like, is becoming broader um, than it was in the past. And I think this is really interesting because when you think about if western boundary currents are strengthening, and they're carrying meridional heat transport away from the tropics towards the poles, then you have an expectation that if they're strengthening, uh, you might think that that's why there's all that heating that we saw at the beginning, right? Which in fact was the hypothesis at this time. And the hindcast models were showing the same thing. <coughs> and what we found instead with the Agolis then is that it's actually becoming more unstable. Um, so rather than having a stronger kind of linear meridional transport, um, the extra energy in the system is going into mesoscale eddies. So that's a very different uh, feedback on climate. If you have more, um, if you have more turbulence in the system, you have more coupling with the atmosphere. You have more cross-frontal exchange between the coastal oceans and offshore, rather than more meridional transport. Uh, this is another one of my favorite uh, pieces of science I did with uh, Pierre Legave, uh, who was a postdoc at the time, he's now back in France. And uh, we looked at drifter data using uh, drifter data from the Global Drifter Program um, in the Arabian Sea. And what I've shown here is, so here's uh, uh, the, the drifter data that this is based on. Um, and uh, we also used the work of uh, um, Lucas Lorindo, who was a previous gra graduate student of uh, Arthur Mariano, who, who developed a very nice uh, global drift of climatology. So we used this, and what we first did was we looked at a southwest monsoon and a northeast monsoon average. So this part of the ocean is quite remarkable because basically the circulation changes from clockwise during southwest monsoon to anti-clockwise during northeast monsoon. So it will be kind of like if we had a monsoon in the North Atlantic, it would be like the Gulf Stream literally changed direction every year, right? So it's pretty remarkable. And this Somali current, which is the western boundary current of this system, is indeed changing direction from the summer to the winter. And so this is what it looks like if you average over June, July, August, December, January, February, okay? So the peaks of each of those monsoon seasons. 
But from previous work, I, and, this, and these are the winds, by the way. So this is the southwest monsoon winds, and this is the northeast monsoon winds. Uh, and from previous work I've done, um, I was very aware that the evolution of this circulation, of course, takes time. And any oceanographer could tell you that, especially the further you get off the equator, the longer it takes for planetary waves to you know, transmit changes in the forcing of the ocean uh, from one coast to the other, for example. And so I was uh, interested in basically taking the drifter data, instead of just averaging over a few months, taking the monthly climatology and advecting simulated drifters through it. And so those drifters would then kind of follow Rather than streamlines, they would follow path lines, so streamlines that change in time, um, so that as water, and we basically looked at water that went, that passed through the Somali current, um, and we would see not, a, not, not just a, a static kind of snapshot of what's going on if we just average over the whole one soon, but actually how. It, the particles following as the circulation develops, okay? So in other words, it's an unsteady system. How do we deal with that? You don't really have streamlines. You have streamlines that are evolving in time. You have path lines. And so we simulated these drifters, and you can see we came up with these crazy, crazy looking gyres, um, cross-equatorial gyres. Uh, it was interesting that at the surface, um, you can see that northeast, uh, the northeast region of the Arabian Sea is not really connected with the Somali current. The Somali current is more connected, actually, um, with the Verki jets, which, is, which are set up in the inter-monsoon season. Uh, and we found a connection there, so all kinds of interesting stuff. And then when we estimated the geostrophic part of that circulation by taking away the wind-driven Eggman uh, component, uh, we found some even more interesting gyres, which basically kind of collapse onto the western boundary. There's no, in other words, that interior pathway across the equator, in this case, is entirely driven by the winds during the southwest monsoon. And so when you look underneath, the only way that the water can get across the equator in this cross equatorial giant is at the western boundary. So the Somali current does a lot of heavy lifting during the monsoon, feeding water in and out of the Arabian Sea. And then this is a hot off the press. Um, it's not yet published, but it is available as a pre publication uh, online. Um, work with, uh, led by Chris Pykuch kind of um, my first piece of work um, related to a new project that I have called Focus, which I'll talk about in a minute. And um, what we did was develop a Bayesian model to combine three very different data sets of the Florida current transport. There's a cable data set, uh, which is basically, there's a telephone cable underneath the Florida Straits. It's been there for many, many years. And scientists at NOAA have been using that cable um, and the fact that the salty water of the ocean uh, is a conductor to measure the voltage across it and uh, and have, get, have that give them a transport by calibrating those measurements every season with hydrography. Okay, So the cable measurements give you an independent estimate of the Florida current transport about every three days. The hydrography, uh, they've been collecting from two up to four or five times a year. And then on top of that, there's altimetry. It's not, it's not a perfect you know, cross the stream um, uh, ground tracks, but we can use altimetry to look at sea surface height differences across the straits and also estimate transport that way. So we took these three independent data sets and the question is, how do you combine them? Because they're taken at different uh, periods in time, they're different uh, separations in time. They have very different errors associated with them. 
So Crest basically developed this Bayesian model to synthesize those data together. Um, it also allowed us to estimate very robustly the errors. And, uh, and we found that the Gulfstream transport through Florida Straits has decreased by 1.2 plus or minus one square drops over the past 40 years. And Chris assures me he's 99% <laughs> certain of this. <laughs> okay, so new stuff, new stuff. Quiche. <laughs> Rachel! <laughs> I see Rachel. Um, and uh, she's working on quiche. So the, you just saw the movie of quiche. Uh, we went to the Cape Basin and we threw a lot of um, instruments in the water. And our questions are, how much water leaks from the Indian Ocean to the Atlantic? You know, there's been quite a few estimates in the past. Um, and, you know, a couple of which that I've been involved in. and. Uh, you can do it with Lagrangian measurements, but there are very few of them. So you look for drifters or floats that leaked, you know, from the Indian to the Atlantic. You kind of count them up and you kind of do a ratio maybe of how many leak versus how many didn't <coughs> leak. And then you use the transport from our array and you kind of come up with a rough estimate of what the leakage is in Cedros. That's one way of doing it. Um, it's not too satisfying. Uh, other ways of doing it are you can trace um, spicy water. So you can trace um, waters that have temperature, high temperatures and a lot of salt. Um, and you can trace them back to the Indian Ocean. But things mix you know, so fast and things also ventilate from the surface. There's a lot of water mass transformation. So that seems, um, you know, that seems not great either. So, what we're doing in quiche is we are approaching it as um, a mixing problem. And so, you know, simply put, if we can measure mixing in the basin in all kinds of different ways with these different instruments, both vertical mixing and horizontal mixing, um, then we can basically get an estimate, uh, then we can get some estimates of diffusivity and then with those estimates, together with the background gradients uh, in the properties, we can get an estimate of the fluxes. So that's what we're trying to do. We're also looking at how those waters are transformed by the stirring and mixing, of course, um, and also by the air sea fluxes. And finally, we're going to try to relate the information that we get um, about diffusivity to um, altimetry. Uh, both from the new SWOT measurement, so where we put this guy, M1, and M2. So M1 is at this SWOT crossover. You can see these gray lines. So the new uh, SWOT satellite is going to measure sea surface height um, uh, at much smaller scales than the altimeter, hopefully around 30 kilometers or so. Um, and we'll be able to look at how those measurements match up um, and maybe potentially uh, combine them to look at, to infer some changes in the leakage. So that's quiche. Focus. <laughs> Paloma. Paloma's hard at work on the deck there. Um, so we went out for focus uh, just, uh, just recently. Um, in August, it was very hot and humid, but um, we had really nice calm seas for the first uh, first week. And what we're doing in focus is we are putting um, an array of sea pies underneath the Gulf Stream, underneath the Florida Current. And um, these sea pies, so the sea pie current and pressure sensor equipped inverted echo sounder. It with the inverted echo sounder, you can send sound pulses through the water column that hit the surface of the ocean and come back and you can measure the round trip travel time and that tells you something about the heat content of the water because sound speed changes with the heat content primarily in the water. And if you combine that with a measurement of pressure, then you know the mass as well. So you have the two components of sea level change mass and 
heat. And with those, we can basically um, measure the sea level. At all these points across the, uh, across the stream, we're interested in how the sea level changes um, with changes in the, in the stream and changes in the heat content. And we, we can also actually put together not just heat, but we can actually put together salt as well. We can estimate, we can use those round trip travel times because temperature and salt in the ocean are so well, um, are so well structured. You have very particular water masses that you can basically use hydrography, all that hydrography from NOAA that they've collected already in the Florida Straits to kind of match up our round trip travel times to temperature and salinity profiles um, in the water column. So we'll have, eventually, we'll have a, quite a few years um, where we can see not only how the current is changing, that's what those contours are there, um, with time, but also how the water masses are changing with time, uh, and together with how the sea level is changing in time. So we'll start to be able to understand, and we'll have all those measurements, I think every 20 minutes, is it Paloma? So we'll even be able to start to understand like, you know, things like flood events, you know, locally in Florida on one side of the Straits and Bahamas on the other side and how they relate to what's going on in the Straits itself. And finally, sea streams. So sea streams is also in the Florida Straits. Um, and in sea streams, um, the Bureau Lab has teamed up with uh, a group from the UK um, and uh, they're interested in adding to our sea pies array so that we don't just get fluxes of temperature and salt, but we also get fluxes of nutrients and carbon. And the reason they're interested in that is because the Gulf Stream injects nutrient-rich and anthropogenic carbon poor waters into the North Atlantic, um, where they drive some of the highest rates of carbon dioxide uptake anywhere in the ocean. So once you bring those nutrients up to the surface in the northern North Atlantic, and you can see on the top left, uh, top right there, um, the inventory of anthropogenic carbon dioxide in the North Atlantic, and you can see how there's just an enormous amount being sucked up um, in that region. And the question is, if, uh, if we think the Gulf Stream is weakening with climate change, right, which I just showed we have a result um, where we think that's pretty robust that it is, um, what does that mean for you know, the future of this carbon uptake, for example? Okay, and we're gonna finish there, but I have to remember a shout out for Eduardo, woohoo! And Guy, who can't be here because he's in New Jersey. Um, but without them, I certainly couldn't do all this fantastic work. Um, and especially it's been a really, you know, hard year um, with a lot of, a lot of work uh, for Eduardo in particular, so thank you. And, uh, and thank you also to Focus and Keish and the Sea Streams teams, a lot of people behind this. Um, you also saw uh, Cedric Geigen on the, on the video, I'm sure some of you know, uh, who's also um, you know, a brilliant technician and wonderful person to have at sea. So I'm very grateful to all of those. And thank you. Okay. Yes. Are you considering to use SWAT to measure the Florida current? The new NASA mission? No, uh, no, it doesn't really have. Um, the reason it's so useful for quiche is because we got, got over the under the crossover, which was during, during the calibration phase, and so it was coming daily. Um, now they've got over the science phase, the tracks are very far apart, and they're only repeated every 20 plus days. So it's kind of, it's not too useful in the Florida Straits, unfortunately. Yeah. Do you have a, a biological component that looks at plankton? Uh, the first uh, full professor at 
a female full professor at Rasmus Harding, Michelle Howery, uh, took plankton samples in the countercurrent below the Gulf Stream and showed uh, similarities to plankton you might find in Newfoundland or uh, places north. And I don't know if there's any uh, benefit to looking at that uh, in conjunction with all these other magnificent uh, measurements you have. <laughs> yeah, no, we're not looking at plankton. Yeah, Keeson. You showed at the beginning that models have difficulty giving this Lewis retroflection in there. Is that, what do you think is the future of that? Is it just resolution? Like, do you think it will be either in a decade? Or um, so, some of the eddy resolving climate models that they kind of, they had like a small number of them in the last IPCC report, they do a lot better than what I showed, that was, I think that was a quarter degree. Um, so once you get to a tenth of a degree, they're doing a bit better, but even then, um, the actual size of the leakage, you know, then you start to get a problem with there's too much choking and you don't get enough leakage. I mean, it's kind of, it's really tricky. Yeah. Is, is there any way to do any of this with like uncrewed sorts of things or drones or remote things or is the only way to do this to actually just be there in person? Well, for quiche, you might have seen we we you know there were a lot of uncrewed, there were uncrewed surface <coughs> vessels, gliders, the Sea Explorer, um, the Wave Glider. So we were using a lot of that kind of thing, and of course moorings, you know, are a way of. You know, we're out there once we put the moorings in, but then we let them do their work, you know. So they're in the Florida Straits right now, you know. Fingers right. crossed collecting all the data <laughs> yeah. um, and then we'll go back and fetch them so moorings are also a good way of kind of remote sensing if you like yeah. over time um, you know when it comes to so with with focus we don't other than to put the moorings in we don't really need to be there but when it comes to sea streams for example although we've got the biogeochemical instrumentation now it, takes, it still takes a lot of babying, you know, it's not very reliable. It takes a lot of calibration, so you need to collect water to calibrate. Um, so it's hard to get away from, you know, your old fashioned going to sea for nutrients and carbon at this point. Yeah, sure. So Florida current uh, result is quite striking, one where there's 99% uh, confidence that there is that sort of substantial change. Uh, so you know, one may say, oh yeah, you know, it's climate change, but what's the real, I guess this is part of your student's dissertation, right? But what's the uh, main sort of driving force behind that? Behind the weakening? Yeah. Um, yeah, so, that, so people have been looking for it for a while, right? Because there's you probably, heard that there's a hypothesis that the meridional overturning circulation is weakening and that comes from climate models so all these seamit models that you run they all show it they all show it they don't necessarily agree on how much the weakening is um, but they all show that the meridional heat transport in the ocean is reducing because the overturning is re reducing is weakening and so the Florida current is the, the largest component of that overturning circulation. Of course, it doesn't just carry the overturning, it also carries the horizontal gyre circulation that just goes around and around, but it's basically the largest component in both those circulations. Um, and the, the, the theory is, you know, it's pretty linear, it's just um, the Greenland ice sheet is melting and it's putting fresh water into the North Atlantic, which is reducing its density, which is reducing 
the formation of deep water, which is reducing the overturning. That's the theory. Um, what's interesting is one of the things that we can do in focus, our primary focus is sea level, um, but our secondary objective is that we can look at the water masses and their transport. And the water masses in the Florida Straits, at the bottom, it's waters from the South Atlantic, south of the equator, as part of the overturning. And at the top, you've got the subtropical gyre, so the recirculating waters. And you can tell the difference between those two uh, in their properties. Um, and so we can actually get a measure, you know, the transport cable is great, but it doesn't give you any breakdown of how much transport of which kind of water you're getting. So I think we'll also be able to address that question again. Do we see a reduction in South Atlantic waters in the Florida Straits? And that would be another indicator that there's a weakening of the overturning. And, you know, as most of you know, um, Bill Johns here has been running a program, uh, collaborating on a program with the UK um, for many years to measure the Atlantic meridian overturning circulation. And um, there's not a you know, solid answer yet. They have 20 years of measurements. Um, so it's become one of the longest time series of the ocean. But you know, as is always the problem, there's a lot of noise, right? So trying to get the anthropogenic signal out is, is tricky. Yeah. I have a question that's a little off topic, which is, I was really blown away by your video. I just thought it was really inspirational. And I was just kind of curious, like, how did you conceptualize making that video? Just because I could see so many different audiences, like, watching that, like, I want to be that person. I want to have that role on the ship. So I was just kind of curious if you could just... Yeah, thanks, Cassie. I mean, that, you know, that's kind of what it's for. I mean... I made a couple uh, ten, 10 or more years ago in the Agolas Current Time Series um, experiment, and um, and they did just that. It kind of blew me away, like how ma how much legs they have, you know, how many people watch it and what pe different people get out of it, and you can show it to any audience from little kids, you know, up, and they'll get different things out of it, you know. Um, uh, I mean, the short answer is, um, you know, I have to thank Deanna because uh, <laughs> we have our very own in-house um, expert in Deanna. Um, and so she's incredible and she's done, you know, uh, she's worked with a lot of us on a lot of these great materials. Um, in this case, I worked with my good friend Dallas uh, to find, because we had, we had found Valerie Lyman before 10 plus years ago and she was so excellent you know it can be hard because it's 26 days at sea and you have to fly all the way to the southern hemisphere and so you need to find somebody who's adventurous who wants to do that and who for them yeah part of it is fulfilling for them a sense of adventure and you know finding out for themselves you know what we're doing definitely because you otherwise you can't really afford to pay somebody enough, you know, to do that. <laughs> Go to sea and be sick and all that kind of stuff. And this videographer actually didn't have a great time on the cruise. And so it's been difficult following up with him, um, you know. But having said that, I mean, it's a great product because he's a professional. I mean, Lorian, you know, you can look him up on IMDB. Uh, you know, he's now doing stuff for National Geographic. And he basically came along as a one-man band you know, with all his equipment, with his drone, with everything. And then Dallas and I worked with him around the storytelling, you know, for the narrative. That's, that's how we did it. That's brilliant. Yeah. It'd be a great sea secrets uh, lecture. Yeah. I mean, talk about a recruitment uh, video and so forth. I mean, the more people see this, uh, the better, as far as I can see. I mean, it's beautiful uh, to look at. It. The, the production quality is quite extraordinary. And, yeah, you did uh, a really good job. Uh, as a little boy, uh, I used to get to go to the National Geographic lectures 
in Constitution Hall before there was television. And the reason I did a career in oceanography has a lot to do with those National Geographic lectures with Jacques Cousteau and other people. Uh, so putting this out is a really good thing. Yep. Yep. I'm sure we'll be getting it on the YouTube, uh, Frozen Still YouTube channel. <laughs> Okay, I think we have time. Thank you so much.